Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Jodie Gray and I'm the Chief Executive at English UK. I'm so happy to welcome you to our ELT conference. I have a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us by our live stream from around the world. We're very pleased that you're here. English UK is the National Association of British Council accredited English language teaching centres. We represent and support over 350 teaching centres all around the UK that in a normal year would welcome more than half the morning everybody students from around the world. I am Jodie Gray and I'm the Chief Executive at English UK. Students so who happy to travel to, you to our learn year. English in the UK do so for more than a very people. special welcome to those of you who are joining us for an immersive experience, experience from around learning about the traditions, history and very culture pleased that you're okay. English UK joining us today association of record accredited English this 2021 ELT conference is a landmark and record-breaking event for English UK. It's our first ever online ELT conference. We're welcoming more than 527 registered delegates across the two-day programme, and that is our largest ever conference. And it's the first time that we're live streaming our plenaries to a global audience. So with that in mind, I'm just going to ask you all to let us know in the chat box where you're joining us from and say hello in your local language. None of this would be possible without the generous support of our conference sponsors, Cambridge English, Ensley Insurance, Language Cert, Macmillan Education and Trinity College London. We're proud to be providing this innovative, challenging, brave programme of content free of charge. Now, throughout the last year, we have responded to the devastation wreaked by COVID-19 on our thriving ELT industry. And English UK is a charity with the aim of advancing the education of international students in the English language. We endeavor to make our activities and services accessible and available to all. Thank you to our sponsors for helping us to achieve just that. Thank you in particular to Trinity College London for sponsoring this plenary. I'd now like to hand over to Alison Castle Kane from Trinity College for a few words of welcome. Great, thank you, Jody. I appreciate that. Um, it's an absolute pleasure for Trinity to be um, sponsoring and joining you today. I can't believe how many people have joined and registered, so it's great to see everyone. Um, we've just been given a few minutes to just run through some things that are new from Trinity and just say hello to everyone. Um, I'll be brief before we move on to the plenary. Um, but just want to kind of highlight a couple of new things that we have for, um, teaching English for TESOL, uh, that is uh, Trinity Teach Online and the Certificate for Practicing Teachers. And then just to recap on what we're doing, a couple of interesting conferences and um, charitable things that we're involved in um, at the end. So just to, um, just to frame everything for those of you who don't know too much about Trinity, these are our key qualifications from Trinity Stars to Jesse to ISE. We work with learners from nursery school age, kindergarten age, age of three, all the way up to action purposes, visa purposes. And then of course we do um, <clears throat> a whole range of TESOL qualifications for new and experienced teachers in our TESOL department. Uh, we're quite excited for 2021 to have a Trinity Teach English Online. Uh, this is our first course to improve their um, teaching abilities. Hopefully I have um, reconnected there. Um, so Trinity Teach Online is a self-study course um, and it's really designed for teachers not so much who are new to online teaching, but really to kind of enhance and develop what they're doing online. There are 10 three-hour 10 three hour units um, and they're all grouped into modules. So um, preparing for the online classroom, uh, that's classroom management and lesson planning, and then focusing on language skills and delivering those online. And then the last module is resources. Um, so a lot of really practical things that you can pick up and use. 
Um, the great thing about it is you can sort of pick and mix, um, do it at your own pace um, when you have time. And um, those who complete all the modules can work towards uh, a level four qualification. So this is a specialist qualification, uh, the Trinity Certificate in Online Teaching. Um, we're expecting this to be available in June. So this will kind of accumulate your knowledge and then you will be eligible for the full assessment and the qualification. We had extremely positive um, responses from our pilots um, on this course. People who just really were saying to us, yes, there's a lot of free training out there, but this has really gone beyond. And I think a lot of that is um, the content, the variation in content using real um, teacher classes, showing videos, observations, and mixing that with activities and exercises to make it quite interactive. Um, and it's very, very much about thinking about not just your teaching online, but who are those learners that you're working with? Um, you know, are they young learners? Are they secondary level? Are they business people? So being able to apply your own teaching context. So very, um, very progressive in its approach. Uh, and again, um, one of the only ones out there now that actually works towards a regulated qualification um, in uh, the certificate for online teaching. Um, the other thing that we're quite excited about is the certificate for practicing teachers. Um, this is a new TESOL qualification at a level six. And um, this really, I think, would be appropriate for anyone who, you know, you've been teaching for quite a number of years, you have your certificate, and you're thinking about the next step, um, but maybe not quite ready to embark on a diploma or an MA. So this is a kind of bridging qualification. Um, this is designed to be done in service whilst you're teaching. Um, 100 hour qualification time, 30 hours of guided learning and 70 self-study. And this is all about taking your own teaching context and assessing materials. So looking at the materials that you use, critiquing them, adapting them, changing them, creating new materials and then applying them. So there's, there's that process um, involved and it does involve four assessments. All of our providers are currently doing this online, as you can imagine, um, and we have a number in the UK, Ireland, Spain, China, New Zealand offering the CERT PT. Um, and interestingly, this is also offered for um, teachers who would like to do the assessments in their native language. They can be done in uh, not just English, but also Spanish and Chinese. Uh, we will be adding more languages in the future. Um, so again, very sort of inclusive, progressive um, qualification. Um, all of the providers that are currently offering the CERT PT all have um, specialisms. So you will be able to find something that kind of links to what your current context are, but some of them that are currently running are young learners, project-based learning, teacher education, technology, CLIL, ESP, exam preparation, and so on. And there are more coming. Um, <clears throat> for those of you wondering, you know, what, what we have been doing with our current exams, um, we are running Jesse and ISC online. Um, if you don't know too much about Trinity exams, we are very much about not just assessing linguistic competence, but also trying to, to um, deliver exams that also have a positive influence on teaching and learning. So making sure that those key skills for, for the study or for employability and making it as real life as we possibly can is, is a real in the fabric of our assessments. And also very much, um, we're looking at what students can do with language as opposed to what they can't do. So we're, we're not about punitive marking. It is about eliciting language from students and getting them to demonstrate their communicative competence. As a reminder, some of you may uh, know, but just um, Jesse is um, our speaking and listening exam, very popular for short stay, intensive programs and features a one-to-one 
um, conversation exam with a professional examiner. ISE is our high stakes exam, um, mainly used for university entrance. We now have a 98% uh, acceptance rate by UK universities um, for students who need to demonstrate their level of proficiency. And also ISC is recognized by um, the UK visa and immigration purposes for uh, department for student visa purposes as well. As I said, we are delivering these by uh, video conferencing now. This will continue to be an option, at least for the sort of medium term future that we, you know, we're anticipating being able to run this either as a VC version or in person when, you know, when we're um, at a stage of sending examiners back to centres. Um, but the online delivery does still need to be within a registered exam centre at a computer station or laptop, but it is the same, these are the same exams, um, the same content and the same certification. I think importantly with um, digital delivery, we don't have any minimum fees or candidate numbers. So that is a real support to schools that are um, maybe operating with not as many students as, as they normally would. Um, and then finally, I just want to highlight a couple of um, things that we're involved in planning now uh, and doing. We have the sixth Future of English Language Teaching Conference that we organize um, with Regents University London. Uh, that's happening online Saturday, the 26th of June. Uh, it's a free event. All are welcome. Last year, we had about a thousand people join us. So um, from all over the world, very international in scope. Um, and we are delighted to have our plenary speakers, Scott Thornbury and Silvana Richardson, who you will see in a moment for the next plenary here at English UK. And then finally, um, just want to talk about the Trinity's Language Access Fund. We launched this at the beginning of the year. Um, and this is really designed to help students who are having difficulty accessing language training and um, qualifications. So this is helping students who, for whatever reason, maybe have socioeconomic barriers or race inequality or um, can't access programs because of their settlement status, um, special needs, disabilities and more. So um, this is a fund that has been set up to help candidates um, and we contribute um, not to just towards the exam fee, but also the cost of lessons or materials, um, travel expenses and so on. So people can apply um, for a grant of a group of students um, up to £2,000 per group. Um, and we encourage you to get involved, certainly if you're working with um, a student, a single student or a group of learners who might benefit from this. Okay, and that's it. My details are on the screen. I'm happy to um, get any emails from you or questions about anything that I talked about today. And um, I'm now going to hand over back to uh, Jody. And um, thank you. Thank you I think um, we had a slight issue with the screen sharing, mm -hmm. but we will be sharing um, the slides afterwards. Um, so that everyone can um, receive your details and do feel free to share them in the chat as well. And um, thank you so much, Alison, um, uh, for your words. And thank you to Trinity College London again for sponsoring this session. Um, today is Earth Day. Um, the rallying call of Earth Day is this. When life around the globe returns to normal, our world cannot return to business as usual. And it's in that context in the context of a global pandemic that has given us the opportunity to improve the ELT sector as we rebuild it. I cannot think of a bigger, bolder, more brave or important session than this. In 2016, Silvana Richardson, the head of education at Bell Educational Services and strategic education advisor at the Bell Foundation, delivered a seminal and now legendary plenary session at the IOTEFL conference meticulously researched, excellently delivered, and grounded in real experience, Silvana effectively dismantled many of the surviving myths supporting the idea of native English speaker teachers and made sure the discussion was put under the glare of the ELT spotlight. Now, I wasn't lucky to be there in the audience that day, but I'm told there was a standing ovation at the end. Five years on, we're looking at how far we've come and where do we go from here? 
Silvana will be introduced um, by Chia Swan Chong. Chia Swan speaks English and Mandarin as first languages and also speaks Japanese, Spanish and Italian. She has written extensively on intercultural communication and on native and non-native speaker considerations and interactions in e EFL teaching and learning. We are exceptionally proud to have these two key thinkers on our program to talk about this topic. I'm quite sure that at the end of this hour, we'll be standing up and applauding in our homes and our classrooms and offices all around the world. Chia on the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Jodie. My name is Chia Swan Chao, and I became a English language teacher in about 2002, um, quite a long time ago. Um, I started te teaching English in London um, and, you know, looking like a non-native speaker or so-called non-native speaker, I kind of was the epitome of um, someone who was kind of lost in my identity. <laughs> I speak English as my first language. I was brought up in English. I went to school speaking English um, and I grew up in Singapore speaking Singaporean English. I moved to London when I was in my 20s, in my early 20s. And soon after, I became an English teacher in London, teaching English as a foreign language. The strange thing, of course, was that my students encountered with, you know, were faced with someone who looked very different from what they had imagined an English teacher in London would look like. I remember in my early days in teaching, when I first took a class full of Korean and Brazilian students, a Korean student walked into the class, saw me and walked straight out. She then went to the director of studies and complained, saying, I didn't come all the way from my country to be taught English by someone who looks exactly like me. Thankfully, the director of studies looked at her and said, get back into your class right now. She's one of the best teachers we have. I was really grateful that he chose to take my side in the matter and the best compliment I ever had probably in my career was when she went back to the director of studies the next day and said to him, thank you so much for asking me to come back, to go back into the classroom, because that was one of the best English lessons I've ever had. That experience really stayed with me. It made me realize that looking the way I did, I would always be encountering students and even colleagues or education managers who might think twice about my ability to teach English as a foreign language, perhaps because I looked like a non-native speaker. When I became a CELTA tutor, I was teaching many native and non-native speakers to become English language teachers. I started to see that many so-called non-native speaker teachers were able to relate to students in ways that my native speaker colleagues found a little more difficult to do. Their own experience, having been a beginner of English themselves, actually stood them in very good stead when they were teaching English. That is not to say, of course, that native speakers don't make good English teachers. There are all sorts of native speakers and non-native speakers out there. There are good teachers, there are bad teachers, there are teachers who are monolingual and teachers who speak multiple languages. I suppose listening to Silvana's talk in 2016 really drove home the point that perhaps schools that hire teachers and students that choose teachers should not be choosing based on their, the color of their blood or <laughs> the color of their skin, but instead on their ability to actually teach. I'm really honored today to be able to introduce Silvana to talk about this topic once again. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say and to see if our industry has progressed since her talk in 2016. As Jody mentioned, Silvana is the Head of Education at Bell Educational Services, the Academic Director at Bell Teacher Academy and a Strategic Education Advisor at the Bell Foundation. She's been teaching English and involved in ELT for over three decades, um, you know, teaching in different sectors and contexts like EFL, ESOL, ESP, um, and Apparently, her current interest goes beyond native speakerism and include Im impactful design of teacher education programs, sustainable staff learning and development. And she is a trainer and a mentor to many, many teachers out there and certainly an insp inspiration to many more. 
So without further ado, I would love to introduce Silvana Richardson to tell us more about the Native Factor and the last five years. Over to you, Silvana. Thank you very much, Chia, for your lovely introduction. I just wanted to check uh, whether um, everybody can see the screen. Can I have a yes from somebody at English UK or Chia? Yes, we can, Savannah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world uh, or in the UK. Um, and hello from Cambridge. And it's quite uh, odd to be speaking uh, at the English UK ELT conference from a venue other than the lovely Prospero House where we normally gather together. But anyway, um, back in April 2016, um, the IATFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language, kindly invited me to do a plenary session at their 50th anniversary conference on the topic of the so-called non-nests, non-native English speaking teachers, people like me. And at the time I chose um, as uh, the title of my session, the native factor, the haves and the have nots, and why we still need to talk about this in 2016. Um, English UK invited me again very kindly this time um, to talk about the native, the native factor in the last five years. Fortunately for you, I'll be speaking much less than that in terms of time. I, I spoke like 70 minutes at that time. So fortunately for you, this is going to be much shorter. But um, uh, what matters is that here I'm going to be looking at what has changed and what needs to change and how we can move forward together to construct, as Jody was saying, a better ELT industry, a more equitable and, and a, a better ELT industry. So I can almost hear you think, well, hang on a minute, how is this topic relevant now? Are there many more pressing issues right now that we would need to be focusing on and addressing, like, for example, the impact of the pandemic or, you know, uh, for, for us based in the UK, the impact of Brexit on the ELT industry? And here are some headlines reminding us, you know, of, of school closures and the impact on schools and teachers and teachers' jobs and teachers, you know, workloads and stress and burnout and things like that. And more importantly, for some of you, you may be wondering, what has this got to do with me? And interestingly, English UK has chosen a program for today that gives us a little bit of a breather so that we can actually take some time and envisage how we can move forwards and construct a more equitable and caring post-pandemic ELT industry. And these are some of the topics that appear in today's program all about inclusion, inclusivity, diversity, sustainability, environmental and green ELT, etc. And I actually, I do celebrate that choice. I do celebrate that choice because right now we do really need to start thinking about how we rebuild our industry in a more sustainable, equitable and generous uh, way. Or to quote fellow Argentinian Jorge Bergoglio, otherwise and better known as Pope Francis, uh, talking about the present crisis and the pandemic, he says, the basic rule of a crisis is that you don't come out of it the same. This is the moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek and to commit to act in our daily life on what we have dreamed of. And I was very lucky to be able to share my dream for this profession out loud on that stage five years ago. And this is what I said then. My dream is that one day soon, every teacher who began life speaking a language other than English will be judged not by an accident of birth, but by the merit of their teaching abilities. And I don't expect that most of you will have attended my, my plenary back then, or and if you did, you may have forgotten all about it. So I just felt that before I move on and, and think about together about what has changed in the last five years, I needed to make a very quick um, summary of what I said back then. So I'm trying to summarize 70 minutes in a slide and share with you the key messages. But before I do that, I just wanted to make a comment about the fact that uh, since then, one of the changes that I made about the way I use language is that I have stopped 
uh, talking about people like myself as a non-nest, and I, I'm just using the word tensor, and by that I mean a teacher of English who's a native speaker of other languages, because the non-native, you know, denies me the right to a, a more positive way of calling myself, but also it kind of denies the right of nativeness sometimes, and I'm a native speaker of my own language. So that's a term that I'm going to be using to talk about people like me. So the first message I gave back then was that it is acceptable in many, many parts of the world to discriminate against professional tensors, uh, people like me, in favor of native English speaking teachers, even when the tensors are qualified and when the nests are unqualified. That this discrimination has a profound and toxic effect on teachers of English who are native speakers of other languages. And I analyzed and went in depth into, into these things. Unequal opportunities in terms of work, um, uh, issues uh, around our own self-esteem, our sense of self-efficacy and our sense of confidence and how confident we are as teachers of, uh, you know, of a language that's not the language we were born speaking. Uh, more importantly, that discrimination is ideological because research into student preferences is much more inconclusive than we were led to believe, uh, with some teachers, with some students expressing a preference for um, tensors, other, other students expressing a preference for um, nests, and many students expressing a preference for both. So the jury is out on this one. And that the causes for this inequality are mainly a perception uh, by schools and by the industry as a whole that customers, i.e. our students, prefer nests to tensors, and this informs marketing practices as well as recruitment practices. Um, many unregulated and discriminatory recruitment practices out there, and a monolingual teacher training orthodoxy. By this I mean, um, you know, a lot of teacher training courses um, teaching and reinforcing a pedagogy of English only that has perpetuated conditions of privilege for those who were born speaking English and of disadvantage for those who were not. And finally, that the nest and non-nest dichotomy is false and that the English language teaching industry does need to take action to overcome it. So what we're going to cover now then is what has changed since 2016 the challenges that we still have ahead and how we can uh, walk together, uh, work together towards a greater diversity and equality in English language teaching. Um, and in order to do that, um, I'm going to borrow uh, um, the ideas uh, of um, Ali Fuad Selvi, um, who has spoken about how we can move towards a more equitable future in English language teaching. And he said that this requires a change of mindset from native speakerism in very simple language, the notion that nest is best to professionalism, i.e. what really matters is not the passport that we hold or the country in which we were born, but how professional, qualified, competent we are as teachers of English. And he says that this um, change takes place if we do three things. And this is what is going to inform my talk. Number one, he says, raising awareness is really important. And Sometimes it's, it's quite shocking how um, there is a lack of awareness of the plight of tensors, you know, of discrimination, of prejudice, of lack of equal opportunities, of social injustice around our industry. So the first step is really to raise awareness, says Ali Fuad Selvi. The second step after that is to build advocacy. In other words, to speak out, stand up, be counted, speak out for this, you know, native speakerist injustice and in uh, to, to talk about uh, professionalism. And finally, he says, as you raise awareness and as you build advocacy, we demonstrate activism. We need to be supporting and promoting, he says. Uh, and this is, uh, and this is a, a task for all of us, for all stakeholders in, in our industry. So from teachers to teacher educators, to managers, to the students themselves, from the, the people, you know, the public in general. Um, 
to be seen to be supporting and to be promoting professionalism in our field and to actually call out discriminatory practices and not just the practices themselves but also the influences that those discriminatory practices have on you know the psychological well-being of tensors as well as issues of you know uh, justice pedagogy etc so with this in mind um I just want to look at what has changed uh, since 2016. So let's get started with that. I would say the first thing that I can notice since 2016 is that there has been an increased awareness of the plight of those teachers of English who are native speakers of other languages. And there has been a lot of um, stage space and space in social media for us to make that issue more visible, which is great. And what has happened as a result of that increased visibility and awareness around these issues is that when somebody like Chia stands up and says, look, I've experienced discrimination in my workplace um, from, from whoever, you know, students, customers, etc. What you get is a little bit of a me too effect so you get a ripple effect of teachers coming out of the woodwork and telling us you know i've had thousands of stories after my plenary and the years afterwards people coming and saying it happened to me too i experienced this i can kind of see myself in what you're saying and of course this um, is natural because three quarters of all job ads in the private TEFL sector are for native speakers only. So it's only natural that we are going to be experiencing discrimination at some point or another. But what's important as well is that this is not my issue or Chia's issue um, or the issue of over 80% of the, of the teachers of English uh, as a foreign language who happen to speak languages other than English as a native languages. I think what we also um, became more aware of is that this is a problem that we all have. It's an, a problem that we own together. Because if this is true, this is the case that um, there is discrimination um, against um, tensors. It, what's also true is that because the job ads privilege the idea of native speakers, then that the value of qualifications, expertise, professional experience is kind of downplayed um, in favor of passports, nationality, um, where I was born, etc. So I think we are all much more aware that this is not a problem that's just mine, but it's a problem shared and that the way out of this problem is to work together. So to look at ourselves and think of ourselves as ethical and principled professionals working together against discrimination, prejudice, inequality, social injustice and professionalism in ELT. So. Once that message uh, became more visible, uh, we, we saw much more of advocacy by individuals and by organizations. So let me show you now a couple of examples of advocates of this um, important message around professionalism. And I want to show you these not just to, to illustrate what happened uh, since 2016, but also as shining examples and models to follow. And in the way that they did things, I hope that you also have ideas about how we can all do things as well. So, um, at that conference, there were other, uh, other, of course, plenary speakers, and two of them actually uh, spoke very loudly and clearly about discrimination and the plight of the tensor. One was David Crystal, uh, where he basically called out uh, discrimination. And he said, if I were in charge of a language teaching institution, I would not be interested in where the teachers were born, what the first language was, or whether they had a regional accent. There are absolutely no grounds for discrimination these days. And he made his ideas known in a, a, a now famous blog, TEFL Equity Advocates, 
Um, and the same thing uh, was what um, Scott Thornbury did. So uh, again, and he spoke out and said, from a purely personal point of view, I have to say that many of the best teachers I have observed or the best conference presenters I have ever witnessed or the most in inspiring colleagues I've had the pleasure to work with just happened to have started life speaking a language other than English. And again, you know, putting those thoughts out publishing them, making them, making himself heard on this issue. And then since, since, uh, since 2016, we see other colleagues that have used their own blogs and their own channels of communication to make their voices heard. So here, for example, we've got a famous blogger in our industry, Sandy Millen, and she says, I hope that this is the beginning of the end and that we will soon be able to say, I'm an English teacher without anyone asking us where we were born. Also, as an example, Lizzie Pinard, another famous blogger, um, you know, kind of echoing Ali Fuad Selvi here, she says, what matters is that we all recognize what has gone on, what is going on, and where the future is or should be, and do our bit to push, to push it in that direction, activism. We are all professionals in the ELT world, professionalism, together, and we all need to fight together to make it what we want to be. And finally, as an example, here is um, Andy Hockley, who is a manager trainer. And in his blog, From Teacher to Manager, speaks to managers and people who are training to be managers about the need to challenge people's perceptions about recruitment. So he says, we have the duty to change people's perceptions, and we do that by changing our hiring practices. From this point forward, if anybody who has responsibility for recruitment says in one of my sessions, we have to hire native speakers because the students expect or want it, I will respond that even if that's 100% true and we know it isn't, it's not a good enough answer. So here are some good examples of people speaking out and advocating. Um, Let's have a quick look at organizations and following again the shining example of, for example, um, Cat Tissel, California TESOL or TESOL France. In the summer of 2016, TESOL Spain released a position statement and I'm going to just be silent for a little bit and let you read it out. Sorry, read it. And it would be really great if many more teaching associations released statements of this kind. Let's have a quick look at activism now. So how people actually took very practical and very concrete steps. And again, we look at the individuals and the organization. So two wonderful examples from two practitioners. One, a teacher and teacher trainer. This is uh, three examples, actually. This is Marek. Um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with uh, Marek Kitskoviak, uh, founder of TEFL Equity Advocates and one of the most um, exemplary models of um, how we can be active um, about this. So interestingly, Marek was a little bit of that famous saying that if life gives, gives you lemons, make lemonade. Uh, he made the most exquisite lemonade of the lemons that he got, which was he was rejected, um, even though he was a professional. And, and if, you, if you know him, you, you know how competent he is, etc. He was shocked to be rejected for a job. And so he set up this blog after that experience being turned down just because he was a non-native uh, speaker teacher. Um, so he started publishing in his blog, free resources promoting equality. So he's got a fantastic catalog of webinars and guides and videos and articles that I strongly encourage you, if you're interested in, in this topic, to uh, look at. Um, he runs online training courses on how to tackle native speakerism, how to get a job as a tensile, and how to raise even students' awareness of native speakerism. And he speaks very fre frequently at conferences about discrimination and bringing about a fairer ELT industry for all. 
Another example, another teacher and teacher trainer is Sarah Priestley. Um, she works for the British Council and is based in Italy. And she, after uh, being there at the plenary, she decided she wanted to do something uh, about, um, you know, the plight of and, and, and raising awareness of professionalism, etc. So he started very small. He decided she wanted to do a 15 minute continuing professional development session for her, for her teachers on this issue. Then she just shared what she had done with others who had missed the session. She wrote a short summary of her session for her teacher's newsletter. All things we can all do starts more from our school. After a little while, she realized that she needed to keep talking about it. But more importantly, this wasn't just a matter for teachers to be aware of. So she organized briefing sessions for customer service staff who are the ones dealing with questions about, am I going to have a native speaker, etc. And she did this with a, 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 tes, a, a tensile colleague and she created materials for her adult students on the topic of native speakerism. So as you can see, and then of course, she blogged about her experience and her materials and she shared her materials in, equi in, in TEFL Equity Advocates. So you see, she's gone from small CPD session with her colleagues to um, uh, customer service colleagues, to her own students, to go in public on, on the blog. And if you want to um, access her experiences and how she talks about the experiences and her materials, you can uh, certainly look at that blog there, that blog link. Um, and the last example I want to show you is a teacher. His name is Adam Beal. And a very interesting example of, again, what I heard hundreds of teachers have also done, which is uh, he realized after applying for a job as an English language teacher that um, the search criteria, the most important search criterion for the recruiters was native speakerism, being a native speaker. So when he found out about that, he not just withdrew his application, but also wrote back to the recruiter explaining that the reason why he had decided not to apply was that the school discriminated again against uh, tensils and advocating for them. Uh, and again, he blogged about his experiences and you can see his materials again in uh, Marek's Deflect Equity Advocates. And now it's a resource that any teacher in a similar situation can actually um, use and, and, you know, like an email template if you wanted to do this as well. And finally, how organizations have kind of started as well speaking out and saying, yes, we're an equal opportunities employer and proud. This is something called the ELT Hall of Fame, which is again in the TEFL Equity Advocates um, blog. And basically it's an invitation for schools to be listed there, those that offer equal professional um, opportunities for teachers of English who are native speakers of other languages and to actually say it that, say it, you know, out loud. Interestingly, in 2016, that list had a grand total of two or three schools in the UK. And now we can see 26, which is a, a great and important increase. But again, wouldn't it be nice if there were many more than those there? And of course, there are other schools from other parts of the world as well as the UK. And finally, uh, let me tell you very briefly about the creation of um, EVE, Equal Voices in ELT, which is an initiative to give parity or to promote and celebrate parity between um, uh, basically highly proficient speakers of English and native speakers of English and also gender. So this initiative actually awards uh, EVE prizes and recognitions uh, to conferences where this is there is parity really. So what are the challenges ahead? We've made quite a lot of progress in terms of awareness. We've made quite a lot of progress in terms of advocacy and in terms of activism. But guess what? There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And let me show you. Yes, there are still many recruiters that continue to discriminate. And here are three examples where um, in, in the ads, they talk about native speaker, Dave's ESL Cafe, one of the most popular uh, places where people go and try and find work. Um, Wales English saying native speaker from US, UK, Canada, Australia, Ireland and New Zealand. And the third um, site as well for online tutors based in the UK actually and um, providing tutors for the Chinese government. Same thing, top requirement, the tiresome 
passport holder of the UK, Ireland, USA, Canada, Australia or New Zealand. So in this sense, things haven't changed very much, unfortunately. So it's still mostly about passports. And we still have this cycle that needs breaking. As Woodward says, when school promotes native instruction, native teachers, because it brings in business, then schools enroll, students enroll at schools that offer native teachers because the same school claims native speakers are better teachers and therefore go on goes the cycle until it becomes accepted rhetoric. This is the cycle that we still need to fight against. And let's throw something newer than 2016 in the mix, which is what Nick Peachy has recently called Uberification of ELT. You know, we know about the disruption that um, technology has brought through, for example, Uber and, you know, um, taxi services and public transport, et cetera, et cetera. And this um, was kind of um, in our industry also kind of accelerated by the pandemic you know, bringing everything online um, and this at the same time creating um, an, a market of low cost, low quality competition. So again, what we're prioritizing here is price over quality. And guess what? When we've got low quality, we've got indifference to qualified, experienced, professional experts. So this is something that doesn't just affect tensors, it affects all of us. But the second problem, if you like, of the verification of ELT in terms of social justice and equality is that it gives people access to, sorry, to native speaker, uh, a native speaker teaching pool anywhere at any time. And I'm just borrowing here Nick Peach's slide. And I think his choice of picture is a very interesting one indeed, because it captures what research has found along the lines of, it's not just about we want this passport or we want that passport, but also issues of racism where um, Caucasian white people are often preferred. So, as I said, this is not just a matter of uh, discriminating against teachers of English who are speakers of other languages in favor of native speakers of English, but also it's a matter of all of us who are professionals are being not, you know, a kind of, mm, this is not important. So it's a devaluing of professionalism there. So let me give you an example, a quick example of a site um, that I accessed on Monday, actually. Um, and have a look at the, so this is for students or so, somebody who wants to um, hire a teacher, a little bit like TripAdvisor, if you like. So um, we look at, at the different filters and the first filter is price, of course. And the second one, have a look. The second most important filter is select a country of provenance of the teacher. Yeah. And of course, the most popular search, uh, you know, the most popular choices are United Kingdom and United States of America. So it's all about the passports. In the second row, we see another filter. And this is called native speaker. Interestingly, it's not really a drop down menu, but it's an inclusion exclusion criterion. So when you open that uh, drop down or in, a, in appearance drop down menu, what you get is only English native speakers. And it says, we will only show tutors who teach in their native language. So again, reinforcing this idea that nest is best, but also, um, hang on a minute, where is the only tensors? It doesn't feature as an option worthy of selection. Even as we said, students are not necessarily as impressed by native speaker teachers as one might suppose, and that's what the research says. Um, again, reinforcing this disadvantage for tensors. But I think, as Freud once said, we should pay attention to what's being unsaid as well as, as, well as what's being said. What's the missing filter here? What's the filter we don't have? And the filter we don't have is only TEFL qualified teachers. This is not even a category worth noticing here or filtering. So how do we move towards greater equality and diversity? I hope I have made an argument for the fact that we still need to do quite a lot of work about this in our industry. 
We still have a problem and a problem of equity and social justice where nests are still the first recruitment choice and sometimes in some settings they command higher salaries and in many settings that tensors are discriminated. So if that is the problem, this remains the only possible solution. We still need to be working together as principled professionals against discrimination together, against prejudice, against inequality. Um, and how do we do it? In exactly the same way. The way forward is to do the same as Ali Fuad Selvi was proposing. Please raise even more awareness. Let's build even more advocacy and let's demonstrate even more activism. So, in other words, be more like Marek or David or Scott or Sandy or Lizzie or Andy or Sarah or Adam. I plead with you, let's stand up, let's speak out and let's be heard. So, if you want to watch my 2016 uh, plenary, I've just checked at that it's still available um, in that uh, address URL. There's also a paper uh, on the IATFO 2016 Birmingham Conference Elections, but actually the, th the thing that's most useful is to visit Marek's TEFO Equity Advocates, which is full of material content resources that you can use. Thank you very much for listening and over to uh, you, Jody, with the questions. You're muted, Jody. I'm muted. Sorry. Thank you, Silvana. That was absolutely brilliant. And I, for one, am standing up and applauding. And I'm sure that others are too. Um, so insightful and so important right now. Um, that quote that you had at the beginning, that the, the, the basic rule of a crisis is that you don't come out the same. That will stay with me for a long time. Um, in June 2020, English UK released a short statement committing to creating an anti-racism action group and updating the English UK membership rules was our first step against racism in the association and in UK ELT. And of course, that will include looking at discrimination against tensors. Um, our announcement was received with a mix of enthusiasm, reserved optimism, but also some pessimism about the possibility that we can make a difference. And we know that transformation is going to be difficult, but with the disruption that we've seen uh, over the last year um, due to the COVID-19, we believe that change is both necessary and achievable and that together we can create a fairer, better, more inclusive and equitable um, ELT sector. So um, this session is so important for that. We have so many questions coming in. And so do please put your questions into the Q&A box and I will address them till Silva to, to Silvana. While they're coming on, just a personal reflection. Um, I studied um, Hindi at university and my professor was an Italian native speaker. She was not only an incredible teaching professional, but her an amazing role model for me. She inspired me um, through her journey um, and was also so empathetic and understanding of the unique challenges and frustrations and joy of language learning and I'll never forget that. Um, so some questions that we have coming in. Um, we have um, um, a question that came in first actually and it was it's from someone who teaches um, CELTA mm -hmm. um, and, um, and often um, sees um, their, their students expressing concerns who are non-native speakers of English. Mm. They are going to be good enough and um, he, that's actually more of a comment that he's directed um, several of these people to your original talk and that has led to them feeling so much relief and often in tears and is asking for us to share this talk which will of course we will do after the session. Um, in terms of um, that term tensile um, and we have a question about where has that come from? Is that your own term? Yes, it's my own term. I haven't, I've started use. I've decided to start using it. I haven't published it anywhere. I just felt that um, I didn't want to be called non, as I said, a non. And I also mentioned that at the plenary. It's just, you know, to assert who you are by starting by saying I'm a non something is such a deficit view of who you are. And it just is not very, it's not good enough. So I just thought, well, how, how can I actually put, because it wasn't just the, a non that I have an objection against. I also had the, this thing about, you know, they're the natives because they kind of, they kind of started um, 
shortening. So the natives and the non-natives, hang on a minute, I'm a native speaker. Everyone is a native speaker of a language, you know, and this is such a fantastic resource to, to learn and to teach languages. So I just thought, okay, I am a teacher of English and I am a native speaker, not of English, but for, from another language. And so are, is 80% of our, or more of our uh, profession. So that's why I just came up with this, which I feel comfortable with. Be you know, if people want to, to borrow it, you know, it's not my, you know, just it's for the world if you want it. I'm sure people will start analyzing it and saying no or not good enough. And, you know, the discussion isn't over. We need to, but I think it's about stopping that non-nest discourse and that, you know, that's not helpful and thinking of what, what we want to be calling ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what about the term native within that? So in given the increased focus on multilingual and plurilingualism in language education, do we, is it time that we start problematizing the use of the word native speaker yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right to point out um, uh, that, that issue. I mean, the, the concept of nat native, native speaker in whatever language is problematic. For me, it was more of an equality thing there that we are all native speakers of a language. But of course, there are many problems around the notion of, of native because because um, what does it mean, you know, if you are born in a multilingual environment where your dad speaks English and your mom speaks Turkish, for example, you know, you're a native speaker of both, you know, yeah, it is a problematic concept. The problem with multilingual is that, you know, Jennifer Jenkins tried and, and, and called, if I remember rightly, multilingual uh, teachers or multilingual English teachers or something like that, as opposed to monolingual English teachers, which is also problematic because, so she meant multilingual English teachers, people like me, monolingual English teachers, native speakers of English. But then, hang on a second, aren't, aren't, aren't there any teachers who, for whom English is the first or home language that also speak other languages? So it, it is, it is, and I, that's what I'm saying, you know, it's what I call myself right now, but we'll see. <laughs> And we have, we have a question from someone who um, is a native, want of a better term, English language um, speaking teacher. Um, and um, saying that, and I think this will be a, a question that many people will empathize with, um, sadly, saying that the company that she works for does state that all their teachers are native English speakers. What should she do? How should she go about challenging this concept and changing the company's mind, her employer? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, this is this is a famous issue and an issue that many, many, many people have had. So I would say if you really, you know, if you think that this is something you want to challenge, I think it's about bringing people together and saying, hang on a minute. Is, is this something we want to continue to be doing? Um, is this something, you know, and show um, sometimes what works is showing people the research on student preferences. And there are, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of research about that I shared in the 2016 um, plenary, um, lots of research. So to say, look, hang on a minute, this is not true. This is ideological. You know, the, the research on student preferences shows a completely different story. And there's also the narrative that schools that hire native speakers this is my unique selling point well this is the least unique selling point I've ever seen because everybody says we hire native speakers so how are you different from somebody else it's a nonsensical kind of concept so I think we do need to we do need to start at least speaking about this and saying look we need to have a conversation about this we need to understand what students actually prefer and take it from there that is, that's really interesting. So I think uh, yesterday in our, in our um, closing plenary, um, we had um, Noreen Captain Spence speak and she said something which was quite interesting about how when it comes to, um, she, she, she sort of had a sense that businesses think that this is a question of what makes me more money, what sells better, um, and that that maybe is, is a conflict or something that needs to be addressed, which is really interesting. We have a few questions here asking about that, like what is the biggest obstacle to this? Does it come from, um, to change here, does it come from business owners? Does it come from um, in, uh, study abroad agents who send students to the UK? Does it come from um, students? Where is it coming from? I think it comes from all angles. It comes from um, from a rhetoric and a discourse that that's very in, kind of you know installed in in, in especially in sp English speaking countries and where students come to the UK. Um, as I said, I think it's ideological and because in, it has uh, in the past uh, been successful. You know, um, some people don't don't ask themselves whether this is acceptable anymore. Um, so I think it's it's about yeah, it's about agents it's about the schools themselves as i showed in that cycle you know that that uh, vicious circle and cycle 
of. Mm -hmm. I sell native speakers as the unique selling point and therefore students rather than professional teachers. And I continue with that rhetoric and I encourage my agents to continue with that rhetoric. And then the students end up believing that. And when you sit down with students, because I did, you know, interestingly, in my organization, when a student um, sometimes comes and says, you, you native speaker, they send them to me. <laughs> so I have a conversation with them. And I kind of, you know, we have a good conversation and they leave thinking, oh, hang on a minute, what matters is professionals, there's no native speaker. So if we bothered, to actually understand the research and the arguments and the fact that students prefer a good teacher, somebody who can teach them well, who a lot of, you know, what the research says that a lot of the time they value a teacher who speaks their own language. Um, so, you know, this is what students say. Then, you know, I think it, it's, and it could be, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe it's, it's time to get together as schools and start thinking about how we can challenge this perception together. I mean, that is what we are hoping that um, some of the anti-racism action work we're going to do um, will lead to. And it will, in, in, in having an action group, and we're, and we're starting off with surveys that will um, kick off next month, where we're asking professionals within the English UK network um, their opinions um, and to try and get a real picture of what is happening um, and, and to get real engagement from, um, from the ground up, which I think is, is super important when mm. you're doing transformational work like this. Um, a question about where that um, obsession, uh, this is um, in the question, where that obsession with native speakerism comes from? Is it post-colonial? Is, yeah. is that where it comes from? Yes, well, if you look at the history of ELT, and this I also cover in my plenary um, in 2016, if you look at the history of ELT, you see a number of approaches from the end of the 19th century, so in Victorian times and, you know, rural Britannia, um, where what you see is um, a pedagogy of what's the beginning of what's called the monolingual bias. So a pedagogy of, in two words, you must speak in English only. Thou shall not speak your own language. Um, from then on, if, if the only language of instruction in English language lessons is only English, and if the language that I know that's the most valuable resource for me to learn the language I don't know is excluded and banned, and you see practices, for example, in the 1950s, Berlitz, actually putting microphones in classrooms and and actually sacking teachers who are using the student's own language. I mean, if this is the space, um, anybody who taught uh, in a language other than English or who brought in those linguistic resources or, you know, revealed themselves as having an identity that's much more, much richer, more complex than just being monolingual, monocultural, etc. You know, they, we felt we had, we were kind of less, you know, we, we were second best. We weren't, we didn't even have a theory to explain why, you know, bringing our language to the, to the, you know, the, the, yeah. So you only see serious challenges to this orthodoxy of nest is best and uh, speak only in English and all the materials being monolingual. You know, if you look at all the published materials, all the exams, everything is about English only even at the lowest of levels when research says that you do need a at least a little bit of, you know, of own language to give the students a sense of confidence and to tap into something they know, you know, you make connections and you learn by connecting what you know with what the new, the, the new thing you're trying to learn. Only, the, only this, um, it begins to emerge in ELT in the 90s, in the 1990s, and, and then you get what, what's called the multilingual, um, the multilingual, oh, I, I'm having a, a, a whoop moment, <laughs> the multilingual something, <laughs> where, um, uh, where basically we're saying, hang on a minute, no, um, this is, and, and, and it all comes together, it's about valuing the students' languages, uh, but also if I am a teacher that, uh, I, I mean, the, I mean the, the final goal is to form and to educate multilingual individuals, then it's important that I am bilingual myself. Uh, 
-hmm. And then you see things like mediation coming in the common European framework where, you know, okay, so you read a text in, in, in Spanish and then you have to translate it into English. All this is happening now. So more than ever before, the role of the monolingual, monocultural, English only speaking uh, teacher and practices and materials is kind of becoming passe, really. Absolutely. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Yes, thank you, Savannah. And we have a, a question, um, which I can take actually, which is about the fact that with Brexit, there seems to be more and more barriers being put in place by the government to recruiting the best teachers, no matter where they come from, no matter what passport they have, particularly a difficulty, as we know, for those running um, summer programmes, um, junior summer programmes that only um, want to employ for teachers for a few weeks or months in the year. Um, English UK is lobbying um, the government on this issue. It's really important, we know. Um, and we also know that, it, um, that the driver of demand to the UK in terms of students and making the UK the most popular place to study English has always been because of the enormously high quality of our English language teaching. We need to protect that um, um, in order to make sure that, that that reputation is the mainstay of the recovery that's going to happen after the pandemic. Um, just a huge thank you again, Silvana. It has been an absolutely brilliant session. I can see on the chat that everybody also agrees. Um, um, it's um, so important that we talk about this now, more absolutely. important than, than ever before. Um, and we really do appreciate you being here um, to share your time. Thank you very much for having me. And just to say, I've just remembered, it's the multilingual turn that I was talking about. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> so thank much. you ever so much for having um, me. We have a closing plenary today, um, today, which takes place a little later on um, at three. If I can just move my, it doesn't want to move. There we go. Which takes place at three thirty. Um, it's a, talking about another hugely important issue um, um, and, and concern of the world today, which is about climate change. How we, um, the, how the English language teaching industry interacts with climate change and sustainability, um, especially given today when there is a meeting. I think they're saying it's the most important meeting since the Paris um, Climate Accord of um, of international um, leaders. And taking place in the US today. So um, please do join us at 3.30 for this closing plenary, uh, which I'm sure will be a, a, another brilliant session. Thanks again to Silvana. Thanks to everybody for joining us um, and we will see you for the next sessions.